Hello and welcome to WriteCast, Write Mentors podcast for children's authors. Uh, this episode we're joined by picture book author Catherine Emmett and we're going to hear about her processes and what drew her to writing picture books and basically everything about the world of writing and publishing um, picture books, which is very exciting. Hi there, I'm Stuart. I'm the co-host of WriteCast Between the Pages and today we're welcoming Catherine Emmett. Catherine Emmett grew up in Newcastle and was an avid reader from a young age. She spent 14 years working in an office in the city before deciding to follow her passion and write picture books. Catherine now lives in rural Essex with her husband and three sons and is a full-time writer. She writes rhyming and prose picture books which are funny and heartwarming with twisty plots and endearing characters. Her first book, King of the Swamp, was published by Simon & Schuster in 2020 with illustrations by Ben Mantle. It was shortlisted for the Portsmouth SLS Picture Book Award and the SCBWI Crystal Kite Award. Her second book, The Pet, Cautionary Tales for Children and Grown-Ups, was published by Macmillan and illustrated by the best-selling illustrator of the Mr Gum books, David Tasman. Welcome, Catherine. It's lovely to have you on the podcast. Hello, lovely to be here. Thank, Thank you, you for joining for inviting us. Me along today. <laughs> the first thing that I really want to talk about is, is where you started with writing, because um, I was doing a bit of research <laughs> into yeah. your into your uh, writing journey, um, yeah. and it says it says on your website on your your really fun bio that you've got um, that you swapped what you described as a, a job making big boring spreadsheets in the city, um, yeah. and you decided to start writing picture books. So um, yeah, I, I just wanted to find out like you know what motivated that decision and how did you feel making that decision going from a kind of I guess sort of secure stable job in the city to the more risky world of book publishing so yeah if you want to tell us a bit about that that'd be great yeah it is um yeah I worked in the city I was straight out of uni took a year off traveling came back got a job kind of working in the city in a, one of the banks and kind of always liked it it was really long hours stressful and then that was kind of fine but it didn't really leave much time for anything else really to be honest so then did that for quite a long time. We had the credit crunch, everything changed a bit kind of around that. And then I had done a, um, my, I was helping my friend do a careers talk with some girls with HR and all this school had come in. My friend was giving the speech. I was just kind of shepherding and sort of smiling politely really. And then my friend got called to an urgent meeting and she went, ah, can you do the talk? So I was like, literally, uh, okay. So I hadn't really thought, obviously I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't been prepped with what I was meant to say. So just said, got in front of these kids and just went, you know what? Don't do this job unless you think you love it. Don't just come in because it's a good job, whatever. Do something you love and just do it really well. And you'll do well at it and you'll make money at it and you'll have a great time. But don't just do what you think you should do. Do what you want to do and just really be passionate about it and do it as well as you can. And quite a few of the kids came up afterwards and went, oh, we really loved that talk. It really inspired us, whatever. HR nearly killed me. They were like, that was not the talk you were meant to give. That is not what you were meant to say. <laughs> but it kind of stayed with me a little bit. And when I got back to my desk, I was kind of like, yeah, I didn't really follow that myself, did I? And it kind of just got me thinking, really. So kind of time went on and then I decided I wanted to write something, but I just didn't know what. So I always had kind of lots of ideas in my head. And I think when kind of banking crisis kind of happened that gave a little bit more time to have stuff in your head really um so yeah but I had too many ideas to sit and just write something I always was like well I could do that but is that a better idea I don't know maybe that's a better idea I don't know I couldn't figure out how to figure out what to start on just always had too much going on and then I had my first son was off had my second son was off and then when I'd had my second son on maternity leave I just started writing and one night was in bed and just got the first sort of bit of a story in my head and thought, I'll write it down in the morning. And then got the next bit of a story and the next bit. And I was like, I'm not going to remember this. Just get up and write it. So got up, wrote it all down. And I was like, this is genius. This is like so good. So wrote this whole story. I think my mum was staying with me at the time. And I was like, look, this is amazing. And she was like, mm, it's okay. It's, it's not amazing. It's okay. And I was like, oh, I, was like I think it's pretty good, actually. But um, really enjoyed it and really liked it and just thought, you know what, if I'm going to do this, so wrote a couple more stories and thought, if I'm going to do this, I'm going back to work in a few months. If I don't go all out now, 
this is just going to become something that I did once. And I didn't want that to happen. So I kind of went out to agents, went on a course like straight off the bat, which I probably wouldn't have done had I not known I was going back to work full time. But I was like, I just don't want this to just get lost in my life. So I was like, if I go out properly and get in, make it a business sort of thing rather than just a hobby, I'll take it more seriously. So I kind of very early on just went right, sent some awful stories to agents, to be quite honest. So sorry. But it at least got me in that mindset of seeing it as, I didn't see it really as a potential career then, but seeing it as something that I wanted to get a book published. I wasn't just writing stories kind of thing. So I think that was the differentiation for me. And then I'd gone back to work again and it was Christmas Eve and I was taking my kids to the first panto. And obviously banks all shut on Christmas Eve. They shut in the afternoon, like shut, shut, like not non-negotiable shut. And my boss rang me about 2.30 and went, oh, can you get on a client call with someone in Turkey? And I was like, dude, I'm literally sat in the panto with my kids. It's Christmas Eve. No. And he's like, you need to get on the call. You need to go. I need you on the call. So I literally spent the panto in the lobby of the panto in Hackney Empire with he's behind you in the background and got on a client call with this Turkish guy. And this, this oh. Turkish client was lovely. And he's like, isn't it Christmas Eve? Shouldn't you be like, not here and I went yeah it is let's reconvene now and I just called it and went no I'm not doing it and my boss I was really angry with him because I was like you should have made that call you know what I mean like you shouldn't have even I didn't even need to be there so I was just that was for me the straw that just went you know what enough I'm not having the first panel with my kids ruined for a totally unnecessary call that we could easily have reconfigured for a few days later after Christmas sort of thing and I think that was just you know what I'm going I'm not coming back so yeah I then just said I'm not well, I had another baby and then said I'm not coming back after that basically so yeah and then we left we moved out of London and then they got really nice and went you can come back we'll make new jobs and we'll make it all lovely for you and I was like yeah I've already left now. <laughs> so yeah so that was it and then we're kind of so now I look after the kids and write around the kids really so my littlest one's still at home most of the time he's in preschool today but he's normally here so yeah I'm kind of writing around them pretty much so evenings in car parks, outside swimming pools, all that kind of stuff, really. Yeah. But yeah, it's great. I've never looked back. So definitely the right choice. Wow. Yeah, that's that's so that's so um, lovely to hear as well that it was your own advice that you were given to do the children's back at that presentation, yeah. which then inspired your own life choices later on. It's funny as well. And I remember sitting when my eldest was at preschool and talking to someone else and there'd been, there was a slightly macabre, sorry. I remember reading an interview by a nurse, like an end of life nurse. It's going to make me cry in a minute. And she basically said that she was sort of documenting the conversation she's had with people end of life. And she just said, no one's ever, and it's kind of obvious, no one's ever said they wanted to work more. They've always talked about the things they wish they'd done, the choices they wish they had taken and the sort of fears that held them back. And that sort of really stayed with me. And I just always kind of thought, you know what? If I keep doing this job, I'm just going to look back and go, what were you so afraid of? Like, why were you so scared? Like, even worst case, if you leave, you'll get another job eventually. Like, back yourself a bit, you know? Like, don't assume this is the only job you're going to have. You've been here, you're well qualified, you're good at your job. Like, worst case scenario, if it's a disaster, you can come crawling back and get another job. So I think that was it for me. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to look back and think, what were you waiting for what were you scared of like why did you not have the courage to just try at least like what's the worst that could happen really so yeah I think that for me was the thing it was like look just yeah. give it a go really and see what happens yeah yeah that, that's yeah, really yeah. really uh, and there'll be a lot of people listening um to the podcast who will be in a similar position you know sort of toying with the idea of of spending more time writing maybe giving up a, a stressful time-consuming job and so on and so that's um i guess a, a really inspirational uh, story for a lot of people and um, they'll, they'll really enjoy hearing that well i hope it's it's hard because it's i'm in a lucky position to be able to do it you know not everyone can just say right i'm gonna stop but i do think yeah. it's a case of within reason within what you can afford to do looking at kind of right what do I want my life to look like and how can I make it look like that as long as obviously you can feed the kids at the end of the day but yeah it's I was lucky <laughs> to be in a position to be able to do it yeah yeah 
Brilliant. Okay, so let's get um, into into your process and and talk a little bit more in depth about how how things work for you. So the first thing I want to ask about is, and this is something that we, you know, at Write Mentor, we get loads and loads of questions about, and it's about writing and rhyme. Yeah. Um, now a lot of people find that it's a kind of a mystic art, and um, a lot of the the things that I hear about it are that it's very tricky to do well. Um, so what what for you is, is your process when you're writing in rhyme and do you have any advice? Yeah, definitely. I think, like I say, when I first wrote that first story, my mum actually weirdly used to write a lot of big long poems about stuff. And so she would sometimes, it, like she did a graduation when she was, she was a mature student and at the graduation she did this big long poem all in rhyme about everyone, all the lecturers on the course and everyone on the course and all this sort of stuff. So when I wrote this first story, I was like, this is amazing. And she just kind of went, it doesn't scan. I was like, yeah, it does. She was like, mm, not really, not really. And I was like, yeah, you don't know nothing. <laughs> so anyway, we kept writing. And then I was like, these are brilliant. And then I gave them to my niece, who was about six. And she sort of went, well, you know, keep trying, Annie Catherine. You'll get better. And I was like, I feel like I'm getting dissed by my own family here. You clearly don't know what you're talking about. So then I had met a lady. I... I really, really struggled to understand meter and stress syllables and the patterns for rhythm. I really struggled with it. And I couldn't find anything. I wasn't a member of Scooby at the time, the Writers Association. I didn't know anyone else who was a writer. I was just Googling blankly stress syllables and like nothing comes up, nothing comes up or it didn't then anyway. And I was just, I don't get it. And then I sort of found some stuff, but it was super complicated. And it was all iambic pentameter and all this stuff. And I was like, I don't know what foot beat or I don't know what this is. And I was like, do I need to know this? Really? Does it matter that much? And then I couldn't figure out if you had to keep the, the meter consistent at the start or if you could change it. Or I just couldn't find it. And then eventually, I don't even know how, I found some really lovely lady in Australia who was a meter specialist. And I sent her a story. And she just came back and went, yeah, you haven't got any? And I was like, what? And she's like, you haven't got any meter. <laughs> and I was like, no, I have, read it. And she's like, yeah, no, you, you don't you don't have any, sorry. And I was like, she was really lovely, but was just cut no bones about it. Like, yeah, you have no meter at all. There is no rhythm here. And I was like, oh. But then she explained what I'd been doing wrong, and it just clicked, and I was like, I get it now. And I'm very mathematical, not musical at all. So for me, Mita is just purely a mathematical formula now. So now it's just very simple because it's like, this is stress, this is unstressed, this is stress. And it just, that has to fit. And if it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. And that's it, the line doesn't go in. So I think the problem is it's hard to find information about it. There's a lot of picture books, if I'm totally honest, that don't have great Mita out there. So it's hard to actually know what great Mita sounds like. But for me, it was probably the most important thing I've ever done for my writing was spend the time to understand meter and to get good at it. And to get good at it, you have to think in the pattern. And that's the biggest thing that I think helps me is I'll go for a run and I'll take the dog out for a run and I'll be thinking in the pattern of the story and trying to find a line that will work. And I'll just keep thinking it and go da 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 whatever the pattern is. And the words will come and I'll keep reading the work back. And sometimes my brain will correct it. So I'll have a really rubbish line that fits the meter pattern. And then I'll keep reading it. And if I'm not concentrating, my brain will fix it to something better. So it's kind of just letting the meter be there all the time. And just thinking in meter is what has really helped me get better at it. Because then it's not thinking something in prose. I never write stories in prose, then convert them into rhyme. That kills it for me, to be honest. I might have an idea of the structure of what I want to have happen, but I don't ever write it out in prose, even though I tell other people they should. But um, that for me kills my process. I need to, I can't stop writing until I've got an idea of what I want the story to be. And I know what the ending is and the twist is going to be, if there is one or what the message is. And then I need to get a couple of lines and they could be the beginning. It could be the end. They could be anywhere in the middle. Sometimes they are in the middle. But I need to get what rhythm the story is. And I've never actually chosen a rhythm for a story. It kind of chooses itself. So I'll just start thinking about the once was a witch who lived in a wood. And she did lots of things, if only she could kind of, you know what I mean? And just get that first. And I can't stop writing until I've got that first rhyming couplet. And then when I know the story and I've got the first rhyming couplet, then it goes from there. And it kind of comes. But yeah, 
for me, it's understanding the meter and really knowing what meter is was the turning point for my writing by a mile, by a mile. So yeah, that's why I'm a complete evangelical about it because I was so bad at it. I'm like, if I can learn it, trust me, I had nothing. I had nothing. So if I can get with it, <laughs> and now publishers will ask me, I've sent them prose stuff and they've been like, yeah, can you send us your rhyming stuff? We prefer the rhyming. So <laughs> to go from that to that, I can get anyone there. I can get anyone there. No one else is going to have that bigger journey because I was so bad at it. So yeah, so now I, and I love it now. Like it just, I find the structure of rhyming stories much easier than prose stories because the constraints, you know, when you finished it, because you know how many words you need, you know what needs to have happened, you know the structure you need to have put on it. And then you get to the end and that's it. And it fits. And it, when you've got the right rhymes, you know it's complete. Whereas prose, I struggle with more because I never know when it's finished. And you, you, you can kind of go anywhere with prose and it freaks me out. So I need to have a nice structural rhyme to keep me where I need to be. It helps me. So yeah, long-winded way of saying just basically talk to yourself a lot. That's what helps me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah, that's really it's really interesting to hear about the the processes of writing rhyme. Because I agree with Stuart, it's sort of a I think it's quite a uh not mystical, that's a bit too much. <laughs> a mysterious <laughs> part uh for a lot of people when it comes to picture books is the rhyming part. And I guess for me, I mean this is a question that I really wanted to ask because another sort of mysterious part for me um of picture books um is ironically the pictures um and the fact that I suppose yeah. you know as you know I, I I personally write middle grade and young adult um and I'm not as sure about the sort of processes of of picture books and working with the illustrator and stuff so um it'd just be really interesting to hear and I'm sure our listeners would love to hear um how and do you work with the illustrator quite closely and also just for you what's the the emotions behind it like when you see your picture book and see your story come to life in in these illustrations um yeah so if you could tell us a bit about that yeah it's a funny one because I think you always sort of assume that there's quite a close working relationship and for me there really isn't at all so I basically send the story off to the publisher the publisher says they like it or they don't like it if they like it they then spend ages choosing illustrator and illustrator schedules are a nightmare like you can't get an illustrator for about three years so you have to wait until they've got a slot because it takes maybe four months to do well at least four months normally to illustrate a picture book so you need to wait until they've got the slot and then it needs to come out in time to go to book fairs and all that kind of stuff but the way it's worked for me is my publishers have been really lovely and we sat down on king of the swamp and said look it was really fun. We got to go to the offices before COVID and they had all its pictures and they're like, look, we see it as being similar to these sort of books. And we see it as having this sort of colour palette and this sort of style. And it was great because we were totally in agreement. Actually, weirdly, it came out a little bit more at the commercial end of what we originally started seeing, which I think is probably for the best. But we were both very aligned at the beginning as to how we saw it. And they'd had some mocked up pictures by an illustrator, which were great. Those initial pictures probably weren't exactly how I'd some of them I really loved but the main character probably wasn't exactly how I'd pictured him and weirdly I sent it to my sister as well and she was like I really like them but the character's a bit different to how it pictured and I was like yeah but anyway I really liked it the style was beautiful it was really lovely done and some of the spreads are gorgeous and I went back and went yeah they're great this maybe we could look at one element but generally it was great that illustrator vanished I don't know what happened um but that illustrator was suddenly gone we had Ben Mansell came in and Ben Mantle's a funny guy because he does so many books and has so many different styles of drawing that I kind of went on his website and I was like, I don't know what to expect here at all because he's got such a huge, he's done so many different books and it's such a range. It didn't really give me a clue as to what I was going to get at all. So I was like, oh God, that hasn't helped me at all. Like, so I was kind of like, Ugh. and you're sitting and you, it's funny because I have a feel of a book and I know sort of in my head what it looks like, but I don't always know what the characters look like kind of thing. And I remember getting the spreads from Ben, the like initial ones that he'd done. And I opened it and I was like, okay, what do I think about? What do I think about? I don't know what I think. And then realized I was just massively smiling. And I was like, yeah, the fact that I'm already smiling just says it all basically. And he'd drawn McDarkley, the character in King of the Swamp, drinking the tea, which is never mentioned in the book at all anywhere. He never mentioned tea. <laughs> and I just thought, that's it. He's exactly, that's exactly what he would drink. So the fact that you know 
that's what he drinks is just you know this character and it was just as soon as I saw the teacup I was like we're done this is amazing so he then just kind of went away and did it I got a chance to kind of look it through and make some comments but to be honest Ben's so brilliant you don't I have very little to add to that process to be quite honest so he goes away and kind of does it and we sort of chat from time to time if things come out I kind of contact him quite a lot and he kind of goes yeah I'm kind of busy and kind of cool and like got loads of stuff on so and I'm like yeah I know but can we just talk? so he's super lovely but he's just like way out cools me basically um but yeah he's brilliant he did such a good job on the book it was so much more than it I ever thought it would be and it's really lovely and then the process with Macmillan for the pet was kind of different it took ages to find an illustrator and they tried a couple of people and things fell through and then I actually went to a Scooby picture book day and saw Penny Morris who's at Macmillan and kind of went oh hi I haven't met you but we've got a book and she said we've got someone really good lined up for this that might work but I'm not going to tell you who I was like oh come on she's like it's really good it'd be perfect and then ages later they came back and went okay it's David Tazzyman and he'd done a spread for it and the spread was just amazing. It was just, I was like, just perfect for this book. It's like the perfect sort of style. And then he just kind of went away and did it. And again, I don't interfere with that sort of stuff. But we had, it's a funny one because we both, I wanted to have the end papers. I wanted to do like a competition to get some kids drawing for the end papers. Actually, I'll show you how on a second. So the end papers are awesome because they are, sorry, I would be downstairs at my desk looking all professional, but my husband is working from home, so he's still in my kind of proper office while I look professional. <laughs> so the end papers on the book, you won't be able to see this on a podcast, but they're basically kids' drawings of their pets. So oh, I got really cool. excited and messaged McMillan and kind of went, I've got a really good idea for the end papers. Why don't we get kids to draw their pets? It'd be awesome. And my lovely editor went, yeah, David's already had that idea. We've already done that. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. And he's like, so she was like, yeah, we've already sort of, we've already done that. So I was like, okay, good, good, glad to know we're both on the same page. But yeah, so I sort of saw the images from him and they were just brilliant. They were just, they're just brilliant. I love the illustrations in it so much. And now it's funny, since the book's been done, we had to do a couple of changes actually at the end. Uh, we had some requests to change the ending slightly and we changed it. So then I was speaking to David a bit more about that directly saying, oh, we're doing this change, la, la, la. And it actually, I think it works better now than it did before. But through that, when the book came out, we started having little chats. And now, me and David are like planning to take over the world now. So I think Macmillan, the, the, the publishers seem to try to keep you apart a little bit. And they like having their illustrators on one side and their authors, and they like doing the intermediary role, which does work well. But yeah, me and David Tasman now are kind of breaching their defences and are now just talking <laughs> directly. And kind of coming up with plans for what we want to do in the future which I'm not sure Macmillan will be happy about but now it's great because we're kind of chatting about the book loads and sort of figuring things out so it's been a brilliant working relationship both with Ben and David to be fair but yeah it's really fun but I don't have a huge amount of interaction I know some some authors do if there was something I hated I would say I really don't like that can we maybe do something with it I don't know if they'll pay any attention to be quite honest I suspect they'd probably go yeah we know more than you do so it's fine but they make me feel like they would take that on board, which is really nice. But yeah, mostly I've been super lucky and have just gone, you know what, you know better than I do about this and we're going to do something brilliant and they have. So yeah, it's been really lucky. I, I guess this also brings us on to, I mean, you mentioned yourself, you you did a course um, when you first started writing yeah. Um, yeah. and now you're leading our Write Rhyme Pitch Book course, which is really exciting. Um, and yeah. that sold out in minutes <laughs> it was crazy um so it's very popular very popular course um and yeah and we find I think from our end we find that picture books are very popular at the moment for people and long may that continue but lots of people are writing them and also yeah. wanting to learn how to write them um and we got a lot of entries for our novel award as well um that were picture books yeah um so I was just wondering whether you know from your opinion why do you think that so many people are now wanting to learn how to write picture books and also on that note any advice for writers wanting to stand out at the moment seeing as there's quite a lot of picture book writers come on the course that's my advice no um I think <laughs> picture books I think everyone's always going to want to write picture books because if you have kids you spend a lot of time reading them and sadly some aren't always brilliant so you're always going to have some picture books and go I can do this this is easy kind of thing 
and also they're short so there's kind of very few barriers to entry in terms of sitting down and writing a 40,000 word novel for kids is hard it takes a lot of time whereas I think people see picture books as being very accessible which they are in a lot of ways so I think it's nice that it appeals to people because they're accessible and I think also some picture books are almost a victim of their own success they're so powerful or they make kids laugh so much that they create quite a strong connection for people and I think people think I would like to create that kind of connection for other people too so I think a lot of people do try, do want to write them and I think Dr Zeus and Julia Donaldson have done so many amazing rhyming stories and rhyming stories kids do seem to love them and it helps them learning their words and it helps with their reading because it helps their rhyming skills and repetition and it helps with their prediction of what's going to come next and certainly with my kids and my nieces the stories they learn off by heart the quickest were the rhymers because you know that you know what I mean it's like a clue as to what's coming next because you know it's going to da 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 so they're kind of easy to learn for kids kids learn them very easily they like them and they know the repetition very quickly so I think a lot of those reasons they're short and relatively accessible to write they can have a real kind of impact on people and they're beautiful as well like you know seeing some of the picture books you wouldn't want to write that because they're gorgeous like you see the David Litchfields of the world kind of coming up with beautiful stuff you see the super funny stuff like the book with no pictures and you're like yeah this is easy because I can do this then you start writing it and your man goes no you can't do this but um <laughs> I think that's why people like them and kids love them and there's always going to be that endearing kind of draw to write something for your kids because you do and first of all no one realizes picture books take about four years to get to market so by the time you've written it your kids are probably too big for it anyway but um yeah I just think there's something magical about picture books and I think a lot of people feel that and would like to be part of it and I think in terms of going on courses it's funny because when I went on Pippa Goodhart the author of You Choose and tons and tons of other books ran a course that I did years ago when I started and she was funny because I sent her, she's like, if you see her or meet her, she's super lovely, super lovely. Looks like a really kindly relative. Looks like she'd make you a lovely, I hope she won't be offended by this. She looks like she'd make you a lovely like cake and just be really lovely to chat to. She nails. Like I sent her some the scripts to get done. She nearly made me cry with her feedback. And she's like, what's your problem? This is good feedback. And I was like, is it? I was like, oh God. So I mean... Do not be fooled by that. She is brutal. She does not cut any bones about it. But she's very commercial and she'll tell you how it is. And if it's good, she'll tell you. And if it's less good, she'll also tell you that. So the course with her was brilliant. But she taught me so much stuff that I didn't know and that you wouldn't know unless you learn. And I think I think I read, um, I think, Story by John McGee. And he makes a good point. Like, you wouldn't go to a Beethoven's concert and sit there and go, that was an amazing musical. I'm going to go home and write a concerto. You wouldn't do that because you know that listening to something and hearing that it's amazing isn't the same as being able to write it. And it's kind of the same with books. And I think I certainly had a bit of this attitude when I started. I was like, I've had a good job. It can't be that hard. Let's just go. And it's a little, you're sometimes a little full of yourself and think, oh, this will be fine. I can do it. And actually, there's a lot more to the craft than people, I think, understand at first. There's a lot more to the structure than people understand at first. There's a lot more to the ideas than people understand at first. So I think in terms of sort of trying to write a picture book now that stands out, when I did the right mentor mentoring last year, it was a bit like, I remember watching, you know, The Voice, where they've got the kid, the guys in the chairs and they turn around. Yeah. And I remember, I think Ollie Mears had just started doing that. And I watched an interview with him. And that's different to The X Factor, because I think The X Factor, you've just got everyone coming in. Whereas with The Voice, they've been vetted beforehand. And he said he sort of got 10 contestants in and then went, oh man, this isn't good because they're all really good. They can all sing. This isn't just going to be pick the guy who can sing. This is going to be pick the superstar. You know what I mean? It's not just it's not just finding someone who's a bit good. It's finding they're all a bit good. You need to find someone amazing. And I felt very much like that when I did the right mentor mentoring and looked at about 100 picture book texts for that. And you kind of wanted loads of them to be rubbish, to be honest, because you wanted it to be like, it's nowhere they can all be this good. And they weren't. They were all great. And you're like, oh, this isn't going to be a case of finding one that's quite good and the rest are not that great. This is a case of they're all pretty good and it's finding one that's like amazing or that's got amazing potential. And I think that for me was a real eye-opener, not only for other people's work, but also for my own work, 
thinking if I'm sending in stories on submission, this is what you're up against. It's not Mrs. Smith, who's 69 and wanted to write a story for a niece or a nephew sort of thing, who just sort of penned something together. There's a bit of that, but mostly the standard's really high and it's really difficult. And there's a lot of stories about being yourself. They're very well written. The rhyme's pretty good for the most part. Might not be perfect, but it's pretty good. And it was a real sort of, actually, you know what, you really need to up your game. And I think understanding the process of getting a book purchased is really important because, so first of all, normally you're going through an agent. So first of all, you've had your book vetted and waded through piles from an agent and the agent has seen enough in your work, your stories, to believe in you to send it off. Then you're sending it to a publisher where the editor is getting tons of stories every day. The editor not only needs to like it, they need to like it enough to take it to acquisition with all the other editors at editorial. And they need to convince those editors that they love it too. So they will go to a sales meeting and fight sales to get it through. So it's not just a case of do you like it or not? It's a case of will you speak for it or not? And I think that for me is a real interesting difference because there's a lot of stories that you just read to someone and say, hey, do you like it? Do you want to publish it? And people are like, well, yeah, maybe it might be quite nice. But then you say to that person, hey, will you take this and fight for it and put your career, not your career on the line for it, but will you represent it? That's a very different thing, I think. And I think understanding the number of people you need to have, not just liking your story, but representing and standing for your story, for me, was a bit humbling, actually. And it made you realise that this can't just be a good story. This has to be a good story that moves people, that makes people fight for it, that makes salespeople prepared to go into shops or supermarkets and say, you have to buy this book because it's going to change you. And to make booksellers see someone come in and go, hey, buy this one. And these aren't my mum or my auntie. These are strangers who will never probably meet you. And you need those people not just to like your book, but to fight for your book. And I think that, for me, was a bit of an eye-opener. So understanding the quality of what else was out there and the, the, the length and the intricacies of the process of buying, of selling a book were really kind of like, you know what, actually, this isn't just knock something out on your lunch break at work territory. This is kind of years of craft and thought and effort gone into this stuff. And I think in terms of kind of how you then stand out from that, I think you have to just go down into yourself. Rashmi, actually, my friend, had done a good speech about um, finding your why and like, why are you writing? And I think that can help understanding what it is you're trying to say, like not making your book super messagey, but what is it about you that makes you different? And like the pair for me, this isn't a book that kind of, it's not a heart book, you know what I mean? It's about a little boy who's really naughty. But that kind of, I've got three boys for a start, so I kind of have an insight into horrible little boys. No, <laughs> mine are lovely. But it's kind of what's different. Like this book's got, I said to David Tasman the other day, my favourite illustration on this book is actually this one. Obviously, I love ghosts, but I love this illustration. It's two little boys playing on PlayStation and one's cheating and putting his hand over the face of the other one so he can't see and you never see that in books. You don't see real life for kids, really. You have a lot of really beautiful landscapes. You have a lot of starlight. You have a lot of real beautiful things that are really moving and gorgeous. But you don't see kids playing on PlayStation. My kids play on PlayStation. All their friends play on PlayStation. Not all the time, but they do it. So I think trying to make your book different and figuring out what in your life can inform that is really important. And I think for me, with the King of the Swamp book, I spent... And it's funny, actually, it wasn't until I went back and looked, it wasn't until I was doing the blog tour, actually, and people kind of went, why did you write this book? And I kind of went, no, why did I? And then I looked back and was like, actually, I was McDarkly when I was a kid. I had a little weird corner of the dark garden. It was all dark and I had a swing in there and I grew little plants in pots and I'd never really connected the dots at all. And I was like, well, actually, every house we've been to, I've completely re-landscaped the garden and put plants in. And one of my favourite things is to wander around the garden, sort of not talking to the plants, I'm not quite there but just keeping an eye on them, seeing if they're growing. And I was like, well, actually, and it was funny. I did the same with Holly Tonks, who was my editor at the time. And kind of went, oh my God, we're both McDarkly. This is weird. And we had like courgettes growing. And I was like, and it is, there's more me in the book than I'd even realized, I think. So I think to try and make yourself stand out, keep in mind, everyone's writing about being yourself. It's a very crowded market, very crowded market. But there's tons of things that can make a great picture book. You know, there's tons and tons of things. And I think when you understand that, I think when you start writing, it feels like you're closed down like this and you're kind of getting narrower and narrower and there's only certain, there's bedtime, there's being yourself, there's friendships. And then you start 
going, you know what, let's look at this in a different way. Let's let the book run away pee. I know, let's write a story about pee that's pinged off a plate. Let's write a story about a hat that a fish has found. You know what I mean? There's a huge world of stories that you can write. And I think it's about kind of taking the blinkers off and stop thinking, what should I write as a children's story? And just go, what do I want to write as a story? And write that. Like, I've got weird stories about all... I've, I mean, I sent my new agent a story, and one's about... When we were kids, this is actually Pippa Goodhart's fault because it was a story that came from her course. She's like, mine your childhood. And one of the things we had as a kid was like, <laughs> what came down your nose last night? And we every morning, me and my sister and my cousin would wake up and go, what came down your nose last night? Like, a bus, an elephant, three double-deckers, and a digger. <laughs> oh, well, I had a whole circus treat and whatever. And so I'd written this story. And to be fair, my agent did go, yeah, I, that's just too weird, man. That's just too weird. <laughs> and I was like, I still have hopes that one day we will sell it. But I think, you know what I mean? Embrace the weird and embrace the angles on it. Because I think that's how you stand out. Like, develop your style, understand your voice, and understand what makes you different. Because if you just want to write a lovely book about bedtime story, that's lovely. It will be great. But is everyone going to fight for it and shove other books off the shelf to put yours there? That's the question, which is kind of a bit. Mm -hmm. It's not what you think of as children's publishing, but that's that's the reality of it. Are they going to take a different shelf, book off the shelf and put yours there instead because they want they believe in it more? And that's what you need to have. And as my husband said, very brutally, don't write as many stories, write better stories. Which was slightly hurt by at the time I'm not gonna lie but he was right and actually since he said that I've written better stories and I've had better ideas and I've waited until I, I didn't just start when I get a bit of rhyme and see where it takes me because it'll just take you who knows where but now I wait until I've got an idea and I know what the twist is or what the kind of this is why this book will sell and then I start writing it and I now write fewer stories, but I think generally they are better because I've had that time to ferment and give them time to think and make sure the idea is solid and has got depth to it and has got a bit of a twist or some an angle, you know, like something that's not just the same as every other book out there, something that's going to hopefully make people buy it and fight for it and make space on a shelf for it somewhere. Oh, thank you so much, Catherine, for all the, you know, for answering all our questions and for telling us about um, picture books and your processes and also your your origin story was was really, really interesting. And I'm sure everyone listening will, you know, find something in that that they connect with, whether that's, um, you know, leaving leaving one job to pursue writing or having to balance childcare and writing as well. I'm sure lots of people also um, have experienced that. So, yeah, thank you so much for uh sharing it all with us um so we're going to move on to the quiz <laughs> the much anticipated yeah. quiz that we do at the end of every episode um so i'm going to be quiz master um and it's going to be stuart versus catherine <laughs> um and we've promised catherine she can keep her course leader job uh, yeah. even if she does badly no i'm joking but um i will uh start with the first question then so um yeah, I'll ask Catherine for the answer first and then and then Stuart and then we'll go like that. Okay. So the first question yeah. is what was the name of or what is the name, sorry, yeah. of the female protagonist in Peter Pan? So Catherine, do you want to go first? Wendy. And Stuart? Yeah, it's Wendy. You're nodding. Yeah. Okay, well done. It is Wendy. Excellent. Okay, got a point. Um did so, you know that, she, that, that name good, was good, good, so, in Peter Pan? That's my interesting fact. That it was supposedly it wasn't a name before Peter Pan, which I didn't realise was the case. So apparently Jane Barry. Yeah, I remember my name, which is weird. Yeah, I remember my mum telling me when I first read it. Yeah, that that's a made up. How cool is that? I think it's really I good. You like made up a whole fact. name. That is really cool. That's Do I get a bonus. <laughs> Yeah, you get a bonus. <laughs> but we did this, uh, yeah, for the, we had a episode with a episode recording with Dave Rudden and he got bonus points for publishing insights. <laughs> it was great. I saw one of his talks. He was great. I've got like copious notes from one of his talks. He was brilliant. Really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the next question then. Um, so let's see if you can do a fun fact about this book as well, Catherine, for extra bonus points. Okay. Um, so what's the name of the juvenile detention center that protagonist stanley gets sent to in holes by louis sacker 
So Stuart, do you want to go first with the answer? The name of yeah, the I juvenile d- detention centre. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I don't know. Pass. Okay, Catherine, you have a chance here. <laughs> I, I really don't. <laughs> I've got no idea. Uh, it's really. Camp Camp Green Lake is the answer yeah, um, to that, that one. Um, I happen to be a Holes fan. That's why that's gone okay. in there. But <laughs> um, well done. Okay, so the next one is what nationality was the children's author Hans Christian Andersen? Catherine, do you want to go first? He was Dutch, wasn't he? I always thought he was Dutch. Stuart? I think, he, I think he's Danish, isn't he, from Denmark? Oh, he is, is Danish, ah. yes. Yes, yeah. Is it Copenhagen has the statue? Of the oh, yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Was... yeah. Um, so he was Danish. Oh, it began with D. He was so. close. <laughs> It was close. <laughs> um, the next one, um, Chris Van Allsburg's 1985 book, The Polar Express, yeah. is set at what time of year? So, Stuart Christmas. first. Christmas? Oh, sorry, who's going first? Oh, it's fine, Catherine first. So <laughs> oh, sorry. Christmas. <laughs> I'm going to go Christmas. Stuart. <laughs> I've, I've not actually read the book, but I know from watching the movie with my daughter that it's at Christmas. It is. Well done, both of you. Yes, it is Christmas. <laughs> um, yeah, I like the enthusiasm there, Catherine. Sorry, okay, I was like, very good. good. <laughs> um, next, okay, and then the last question yeah. um, is finish the title of the award-winning book by Kieran Millwood Hargrave, okay. The Girl of What? So, Catherine? It's Ink and Stars, isn't it? Stuart? Yeah, it's Ink and Stars. Yeah. It is Ink and Stars. Yeah, no well done, both of you. I have completely lost count of who got, I think. I think I Stuart won. I think actually Stuart won that I with the Stuart nationality won. one. Oh, yeah. my gosh, Stuart. <laughs> that's the first well, time I've ever won. Yeah, well, that's the first time I've ever won. Yeah, right, please tell me that. <laughs> usually, oh, I'm glad they were okay. Usually I'll only get one out of five, so that was an exceptional performance from me to get three. <laughs> well That's done well again. thank you for thank you for joining us Kat, and for for surviving the book quiz <laughs> <Isn't> that, <laughs> yeah that's the biggest achievement surviving the book quiz the biggest <laughs> the biggest no. achievement was the quiz thank you so much yeah, for thank, thanks guys. so much for joining us no thank you and thank you guys for all that you do to kind of make right mental as great as it is it's brilliant oh it's really brilliant. thank you thank you and we thanks, and Catherine. thank you for being our new course leader as well so it's very, very exciting to have you on very board exciting. for that as well yeah <laughs> okay and that's the yeah. end of episode six of right cast between the pages remember that writing can be lonely but it doesn't need to be may the force be with you